welcome into a special edition of Felco Football Recap Live with Tom Waddle, Olin Krutz. I'm David Kaplan. Well, it has not been a quiet offseason, gentlemen, for the Chicago Bears. Justin Fields is a Steeler. Keenan Allen is a Bear. They've added to the offensive line, maybe not a big-time player yet, but they have dabbled at least in getting more depth there. So, Olin, let before we get to Justin, what do you think about what they've done on the offensive line as opposed to what they were in 23 uh, when they struggled there a bit? Man, first of all, Tom and Cap, I'm so happy I haven't been on the radio every day talking <laughs> about this this subject that you guys we're about to talk about tonight. I mean, oh, wow. uh, people have been emotional about, passionate about that. I mean, I guess you could talk about uh, that's what's great about the Chicago Bears fans. But uh, you guys have done a great job, you know, always being honest and giving your guys side and actually what you see on film and just telling people actually what you think. Now, as far as the offensive line, Cap, uh, I know you said they've added depth, and Coleman Shelton is a nice player, and Ryan Bates, nice player, right? And, and Matt Pryor, and I think today they signed Jake Curran from the Seahawks, nine starts. Uh, look, I always tell people this. It's not me saying they're average. It's not me saying uh, uh, they are what they are. It's what you pay them, right? And I hear the rumor about uh, Coleman Shelton is one to three million. I mean – the starting centers in the NFL right now are making ten to twelve million dollars a year, right? Ryan Bates is at three million a year. The star, the best guards in the world right now make twenty to twenty-one million dollars. You just gave Keenan Allen twenty something million dollars. You gave your safety, your older safety, you bought him in on this defense, Kevin Byer, and you gave him seven and a half million a year. Yeah, Cap. I mean, yeah, whatever. They, they added nice pieces. I, I'm not buying. I, I'm not sold yet. I, I gotta. I gotta tell you, if I put their offensive line on a grease board and, and I'm a fan of, of coach Morgan I'm a fan of a lot of guys on that offensive line there's no sure things on that offensive line there's not one right talk about Darnell Wright going through your first offseason Tom will tell you it's the first time you are not organized training you have to take care of your own body you got to get yourself ready for the season second year is always an interesting year for guys Darnell Wright will be watching him how does he come back this offseason in shape ready to go Braxton Jones will take the next step well, they use picks in the draft, but even then, it's just rookies. So this offensive line cap remains, as we know, for years around here, a question mark. I think he's doing us a favor in the media, so we always have something to complain about. <laughs> Tommy, what did you think about the addition of Keenan Allen? Plays your old position. He's a six-time Pro Bowler, but he is 32 years of age. Well, he plays a position. I have no idea. I can't relate to that because he <laughs> plays at such a high level. Um, I, I real quick, Cap, I'll go back to what Olin said. Like, look, I wish they would spend top dollar on a center because for reasons we've mentioned doing this show over the course of the last 12 months, especially when you have an inexperienced NFL quarterback, such a vital component to what you're trying to do on offense. So here's hoping what they've done so far is going to provide the answers, but I would, I would prefer I'm with Olin. I would, if, Look, spend a ton of money on the best center in the NFL, and you're never going to get an argument out of me. As as with regard to Keenan Allen, he's just one of these guys that I love. I mean, I get it. He's going to be 32. I would be shocked if there isn't some sort of, of conversation about a two-year contract extension going forward. I'm not bothered by them giving up a fourth-round pick because I do think it's going to come with an extension. So let's say that, you know, you get at least two really good years out of Keenan Allen. Now, look. Everybody knows you're going to have to just come to terms with the fact that he's going to miss a couple of games, probably with a bulky hamstring. That's just reality. But last year, I think he missed three or four games and still had over 100 catches. So silky smooth route runner can play inside, can play outside. He's kind of a just he's an artist at the position and no wasted motion. And, and I think it's exactly what a young quarterback needs is somebody that is always going to be where you expect him to be. He's going to be dependable. Look, he's an elite receiver, and if you get in that offensive huddle and you've got D.J. Moore, you've got Keenan Allen, you've got Cole, you get Gerald uh, Everett in there uh, in 12 personnel, and then maybe potentially add a, a rookie wide receiver, I think you've created some infrastructure for an offensive, for a quarterback that hasn't existed in this organization in years. When we had Ryan Poles on our show and we asked him, what did he learn from Kansas City going through the process of scouting Justin Fields and as, as a group, them evaluating him and then drafting him and then developing him. The word that kept coming up in the conversation was infrastructure. 
I can't imagine there's been a better infrastructure for a first overall pick coming into his rookie season in the National Football League than the one that will exist here in Chicago. I think you got to go back to Andrew Luck. Um, look, the Rams traded up for Jared Goff years ago, but that team offensively in the huddle wasn't as potentially as sound, minus the center, of course, um, as as this Bears team could be. So, um, look, I think Keenan Allen's just another friendly piece to the puzzle, and it's what your young quarterback needs to to excel early on and develop. So I bet a really, really good friend of mine that Keenan Allen, my friend, said to me, okay, he's got to play 13 games for you to win that bet. Mm -hmm. And we bet dinner. And my one concern after I made the wager was, well, if he's pulling his hamstrings in San Diego or Los <laughs> Angeles, what's he going to do here? But it's like 26 degrees with a wind chill off the lake. Uh-oh. Oh, oh my, my hamstring. Well, you so got to factor not- cap. You got to factor that into the equation. And like I said, it doesn't mean he's not a, you know, a tough player. It's just some guys are built differently. Olin could tell you that. Some guys, you know, their hamstrings and their tendons and their their ligaments are like are, are like guitar strings. And other guys have a, a, a lot of give. And if you're someone who has a history of a hamstring problem, yeah, you're right, Cap. I mean, there's a chance that that hamstring gets healthier sooner in Southern California than it does here. But, look, this is just reality. I mean, he's going to probably at his age and with his injury history, he's going to miss a couple of games. But – his production is elite. So it's just one of those things I, for me, I, I'm okay with. Yeah. And, and Cap, for guys who cover them, uh, DJ Moore, Keenan Allen, Coco Met, Everett, DeAndre Swift, uh, you know, it's a big improvement. And you're, we're thinking to take Kayla Williams at quarterback. Uh, obviously, they're seven on seven champs right now, right? So uh, hopefully, <laughs> hopefully the O line holds up. Uh, you know, I think 2013, maybe, yes. Uh, probably have talked about this a million times on the radio. The last time we saw something like this, right, with Brandon Marshall, Jeffrey, Matt Forte, and the get Martellus Bennett of those kind of those kind of players for a dynamic offense on a football field. And we all know what their defense brings. So uh, Keenan Allen, like Tom, a while of Tom, and you're saying, uh, um, Cap, and uh, for everybody on the podcast, it was me who bet Cap that he wouldn't play more than 13 games. Uh, Obviously, Cap. Okay. So now I know not to talk to Cap about anything I, unless – yeah. now you can't trust him. So it, it's good. I'll have Cap never text me again about anything. He'll never get an answer again from me about anything. I feel they, like – now, now, now you've lost all trust. But, in but I, feel, I feel validated that, like, Olin – like, you agree with me, Olin. Like, there's no chance. That's just reality. It doesn't yeah. make you soft. It just Yeah, means, I felt like I got bamboozled. When you get older, it's like – yeah, you know, you don't, you don't, you don't get, you don't get more durable when you get older, especially when you're coming uh, to Chicago. But you can see what Ryan Poles is doing. He is trying to make a young quarterback comfortable here, and he's trying to make get make his job a lot easy, easier, make Shane Walter's job a lot easier to call plays. And if you watch the offense in last year with Kellen Moore, and I don't know what you guys thought, but I thought Everett was a really nice addition. I think he does well what Cole Komet doesn't do well. I think Cole Komet. Wasn't a great blocker off the ball. He wasn't a great route runner off the ball. So it's it's a nice addition, and they're putting pieces around. DeAndre Swift interests me. We, 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 we talked about a lot last year on our podcast about third down back. We wanted somebody dangerous out of the backfield. Now, one thing I think about when I watch Swift is, gosh, he's played with the two best offensive lines in the league, right? Detroit Lions and Philadelphia Eagles. Uh, uh, now he comes to Chicago. What's he going to look like behind what is not maybe a young, improving offensive line? but not one of the top two or three units in the NFL. Yeah, after I got off the phone with Olin, I was talking to Tommy. He says the same thing. I'm like, idiot. What are you doing? I put that that uh, uh, that uh, 13 game was was my hedge bet. I knew it. I said, okay, I'm gonna give him, I'm gonna give him 13 games. I'll win this bet anyway. And of course, you know my my I uh, tried to. I get boastful. Yeah, we'll get this done, Olin. No problem whatsoever. Well, Kevin, Tom, what is Tom? A, what is the history of uh, oh, I, you know, I was thinking about this older wide receivers, the, the wide receiver position. Can guys play late in their career at a high level? Yeah, I think so. I mean, look, there, you know, it's there are fewer and, and, and farther between. I think Anquan Bolden's a good example. Mm-hmm. I think Randy Moss played at a high level going later in his years. These, they're all. I mean, look, you're 
you don't last as you, everybody knows you don't last as a 13 year player in the league if you're not playing at a very high level. So, yeah. you know, Jerry Rice obviously did it. Anquan Bolden did it. I think Chris Carter did it. You can do it, but like, this is not, a, as you guys were talking, it's not a controlled environment here in Ola. It's the first thing I said to Cat. He goes, how do you like the Keenan Allen trade? I said, I think it's really good. I said, the first cap you can, you, you can, you know, I first thing I said to him, Olin, was you better just accept the fact he's not going to play more than 13 games because <laughs> you know, like, he's, I set him know, up, Tom. I yeah, set him up, man. Yeah. And <laughs> I, didn't three minutes. I didn't say it in a derogatory fashion either, because no. if I can get 90 catches out of a guy in 13 yeah. games, then then he yeah. served his purpose. Yeah, it was kind of like when I wanted um, Armstead, the left tackle for the Dolphins. And I said, if he gives you just 10 or 11 a year, that's enough. Yeah, because it's 10, 11, a uh, left tackle uh, for the Bears, 10, 11 games at an elite level is worth it to me. Yeah, uh, we had a question. There it is. Rick Bernico says, considering all the assets you got last year's trade, you get Caleb Williams and you got DJ Moore and the picks and Darnell Wright. And next year you get a number two pick from Carolina. Is that the best trade in Bears or even NFL history? He says, for me, the Herschel Walker deal will always go down as the best trade in NFL history. But that's a pretty darn good one, guys. Do you mm -hmm. both – how do you feel about looking back now at the trade? I mean, you can't feel bad about what Ryan Pose has done since he gutted the roster his first year and then, you know, traded that pick to the Panthers and the Panthers played bad and he got the number one pick and now you have the number nine pick. I mean, they ended up on the right side of this trade cap now – I haven't studied the history of NFL trades. Um, just knowing Chicago Bears history, you know, it's hard to beat this trade right now. But um, a lot of people are celebrating some things, guys, that like like you're winning off seasons. Like I haven't seen anything yet. Like I, I understand. It looks great. All You know, I've seen a lot of guys taking victory laps after they traded uh, Justin Fields. It's like, guys, like the story's not written yet. Like you're like, again, you're selling me on off season success. It looks good. It looks good, and it looks like it's, it's going to work out, but you still have to get on that field, and you have to get to the playoffs, and you have to win a playoff game Yeah, for, I, for, for me to say yes. I was going to say, Olin, uh, look, it's a bit premature to evaluate that. I like what they did last year. I really, mm -hmm. I really do, and I thought it was the right time to make that move. I think they still needed another year to develop and, and, and really evaluate Justin. And I thought it was a good opportunity because their roster was so bad to add a number of pieces. I think if, if you know, history's kind to this team with regard to the quarterback situation and Caleb Williams goes out and plays exceptionally well, I think you've got a strong case to make that argument. If for whatever reason, the quarterback situation going forward doesn't work out, guess what happens? then people are right or wrong going to look back 10 years from now and say, well, you had that first overall pick. You should have used it on CJ Stroud. You know how fickle the NFL universe can be and critics can be. So I, I don't, I like the trade. I thought it was fantastic. Uh, I do have high hopes for Caleb Williams and, and you know, what, what he has going for him going forward. But before I can sit here and tell you this was the greatest trade in, in NFL history, we got to see what the first overall selection in this year's draft actually turns out to be. All right. The elephant in the room is that Justin Fields is now a stealer. Mm -hmm. And we took calls on our show. Tommy took calls on his show with Sylvie today uh, all day long. I'm listening to the radio, and there are some people excited, like old said, ready to take a victory lap. Yep, we got Patrick Mahomes coming to town. Mm -hmm. Pump the brakes. What did you guys think of only getting a sixth round pick? I felt like he could not be in the locker room with Justin. Do you guys agree with that? Um, yeah, yeah. I mean, I think we said mid season, what if you kept both of them, right? I think we we talked about that on this podcast. And then, you know, Kyle Long went on Twitter and act like he made it up. But that's okay. You know, like you gotta you gotta do what you gotta do, I guess. You know what I mean? I don't know. I, anyway, um, as far as you, you, I mean, you can only get what people are offering, Cap, right? And and like right. you said, um, it got so emotional in this town over the decision. I mean, I guess you don't want to walk Caleb Williams out there and have people chanting for Justin Fields at Soldier Field, right? That would right. be a hard situation to come into. 
I didn't think about all that when, when I would say, okay, put, you know, uh, um, when logic's not working, I think we said on this podcast, maybe you go against logic, right? When, when, when you haven't been able to find a quarterback all these years, maybe you put two young quarterbacks in the room and have them fight it out. Uh, now, now this city, maybe Ryan Post, uh, uh, took the, took, took the temperature of the city and said, man, we can't do that here. Like there's just no way I can keep Justin Fields in that locker room with the way this city feels about Justin Fields have to, and then they come to Soldier Field and start chanting for him or booing Caleb Williams. Uh, and now the kid doesn't even have a chance. He hasn't even stepped on the field. So uh, if, if that's all you could get, if the six round pick is all you can get, uh, that's what you trade him for. That's what he's worked. And, and a lot of people have talked about Tom. Uh, his film isn't great, right? Like, like anybody who knows football, any, all the experts, anybody who watches film, uh, you, we all see the same things when you watch Justin Fields, right? We all see him struggle in the passing game, uh, struggle to get the ball out quickly, struggle to see the blitz, struggle to redirect protection, struggle with all those things, right? There's one thing I will say, though. Uh, the experts have been wrong a lot in the NFL about quarterbacks, right? And, and I'm a guy who I believe they should have traded Justin Fields and draft the quarterback number one, whoever you think is the best. I agree with what Ryan Poles is doing. I hope Justin Fields proves us wrong. I hope he goes out there to the Steelers, and I hope he does do well just for his career. But I don't see that on film. He would have to make a big jump there when he goes to Pittsburgh. He would have to make a big jump in the passing game, as the NFL is telling you with what he traded for to improve his game. Yeah. Um, you know, look, I have a lot of respect for him. I really do. Um, handled the entire situation. Handled himself with class and dignity and professionalism for his entire three years here. I've said now for a long time, I've been very consistent with how I feel. I thought that the lack of success was shared culpability. Like, mm -hmm. um, I think that the, you, you know, again, I, re I referenced how Ryan Poles told us the process they went through in Kansas City, especially at the quarterback position. It's about infrastructure. The infrastructure for Justin Fields was horseshit. Mm -hmm. I mean, let's just face it. When, when he came here as a rookie, you had Ryan Pace and Matt Nagy trying to keep their jobs. They put him on the field against Cleveland, and you basically pushed someone down a flight of steps. He got sacked nine times. He had no chance. Uh, then the, his second year, you change administrations, you change coaches, and you're in a full rebuild. And I understand why Ryan Poles did that, but that doesn't help the quarterback. So year two of his time here, he's got a new system, which is the third system in three years for him because he comes from Ohio State. He's got the Nagy system. Then he's got the Luke Getze system. It's a lot to ask. It's not an ideal situation. Year three, they tried to try to help him out with DJ Moore and Darnell Wright, some other things. But look, I have a lot of respect for him. I have some sympathy for him. I think he was he was a victim of circumstance. The infrastructure was not there for him. But he also has to assume responsibility for not not playing better. And so when I say shared culpability, he's involved like 10 wins in three years. Not all on him. Don't get me wrong, but he's got to share responsibility. They played like the last eight games of this past season. And we've talked about all of this is when he showed his greatest improvement. Right. All the improvement. Their offense was held score. No touchdowns in three of those eight games. I mean, you can count the one the seven play one yard drive against Cleveland is an offensive touchdown. If you want, I don't. Um, so, I mean, there was just holes in the game. It wasn't good enough consistently enough. And I understand why they decided to move forward. Uh, he finds himself in a position in C in, in Pittsburgh where I think, you know, he's got more of a chance. He he's got Arthur Smith now as an offensive coordinator, as a backup, maybe he'll get a chance to play. He, Arthur Smith would divide design an offense that, that better suits his skill set. So um, I got to tell you guys, like when I, when I heard that the trade had finally been made, I think on Saturday, my first response was I, I was relieved from every perspective. Oh, Join the club. <laughs> well, I was, I was relieved for Justin. Like he doesn't want to live in this limbo. I was relieved for the bears because like they're, they want to pivot and go in a different direction. I was relieved for us because we've been talking about this shit forever I just felt a sense of relief. I just, and the Ola and I, I've been saying this a lot. I know it kind of flies in the face of what most former players feel. I think the game is different in 2024. I think, you know, Caleb Williams made $10 million last year in NIL money. Mm -hmm. Like that's a different atmosphere than you and I grew up and certainly me. Um, 
And I just didn't think that it was good for anybody, for Justin, for Caleb, for Poles, for the offense, for anybody, for those guys to share a locker room. The days of a good old-fashioned competition, I just don't know that that's the right formula in 2024 in this particular situation. So maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I've just grown soft in my old age. But in this particular situation, as I said, my my biggest you know, feeling when I heard this was relief for everybody involved. I think also, Cap, I think something that's talked about, is what Tom thinks about this. I, I think what didn't get talked about enough is, yes, uh, we all have his film. We all know, like Tom is talking about, that they didn't build a strong enough offense around him. And I, we talked about that on this show. Like, like it, it's shocking you fire Lou Getz at the end of the year. Like, like, we talked about changing play callers during the year. You knew you were going to fire him, right? It's just confusing for Justin Fields. It was confusing for all of us watching the rookie right tackle play pretty good, but still a rookie right tackle, right? You got DJ Moore. You got Mooney not taking a step. Khalil Herbert hurt. Um, you know, you have uh, Lucas Patrick at center. You have Nate Davis uh, in and out of the lineup. You have, you, know, you have a left guard, Tevin Jenkins, plays at a high level when he plays, but when does he play? So a lot of questions on that offense. So I think to myself, why you moved on from Justin Fields is is not as much to do on Sunday. No matter what we hear from them, it's Monday through Saturday, right? It's, it's what do they see? And we heard him say during the year, um, the coach is giving me a lot here, right? To me, man, as, as a center, as a quarterback, that's, we're in information position. Like when I hear that, I kind of, whoa, you know, like you're, it's too much. To, like I like to talk to Luke Getze about how much of your playbook could you call? Right. There's other reasons here that no one's talking about. They want they don't want to say about Justin Fields because he is a good guy and you don't want to ruin somebody on the way out of town. And we'll see you in Pittsburgh. But there's other reasons here you move on from a quarterback. There's other reasons here that you move on from a quarterback and go to Caleb Williams. And we'll see if it comes up even in Pittsburgh. Right. How much of the playbook can Arthur Smith put in for Justin Fields? How much do they have to change? How much do they have to run an a, a, a offense for him? Run the ball too much? And then can he stay healthy was another big part of it. Was the offense you have to run to win with Justin Fields, he couldn't stay healthy. Here's another hey, Cap, question. Cap, Cap, real quick, Cap, what was the saying that Joe Madden used to say? Do simple better, right? Yes. That's Do what I'm saying. Better. It's what Olin and I have talked about of the entirety of this season. Do the simple thing better. Take your layups. Make life easier on you. And it just felt like for the entirety of the time here that simple was hard. And hard was simple, if that makes any sense. Like, he could do shit that no one in the league can do. Like, let's be yeah. honest. Like, Lamar at his age can't do what Justin does with the ball in his hands. Justin's one of one with the ball in his hands. Lamar Jackson threw for 36 touchdown passes in his second season in the National Football League. He was the MVP of the league. I'm not sure Justin has thrown for 36 touchdown passes in three seasons. So, like – some of these comparisons that people are trying to make just don't they, they, they just don't work for me. And I think what I saw most was is the simple things were hard and the hard things were simple. But if you can't do the simple things well, they just it doesn't nothing ever falls into place for you. And it just it just it wasn't good enough often enough. And everything just either had to be this miraculous play or it had to be perfect. And and I'll say this about Luke Getze, and I know everyone thought he was football Satan. I didn't think he was the world's greatest offensive coordinator, but I didn't think he was a, a football Satan. I'll tell you, in the red zone, there was a lot of creativity that occurred. And some of it was Justin, and some of it was play design. And I thought that, you know, over the course of their time together, that's where they they were they were best. Yeah, but you know what's hard? You know what's hard? <laughs> it's hard is, is analyzing a team and trying to figure out, is it the play caller or the quarterback? And the end of the year, they fire both. <laughs> right. <laughs> yes. and, and, and so I don't. I still don't know. I still don't know what happened there. Okay, a couple things. Albert Breer from Monday Morning Quarterback, who we get every Tuesday on our show, and Tommy will tell you, he's awesome. You guys saw him at the combine. Yeah. He's really so dialed awesome. in. Yeah. Has a great relationship with Ryan Poles. He said that when he went to the Senior Bowl for a week, that he asked multiple different teams that had guys down there, Justin Fields or Luke Getze, who's at fault? He said, and overwhelmingly, almost every guy to a man said, it ain't on Getze, it's on the quarterback. So and so you're telling me the coaches blame the player. I'm shocked, Cap. That's stunning. Ooh, man, 
I am stunned by that. That the coaches <laughs> all think it's the player. I just, they I can't all, believe it, Cap. They, they all have to have their coaching buddies. Oh can, no doubt. No. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. It can uh, basically it, all the players feel that it's the coach's fault, right? No question. <laughs> right, Greg, right, Greg Johnson right. wants to know who is our vet to mentor the first pick. Is that Tyson Bajan? Is it Brett Rippon who just signed? Or do they go out and sign like a Ryan Tannehill or somebody like that to be a mentor to Caleb Williams? Here's how you have to be as a pro. What do you it's got? Not either, it's not either of those guys. Those guys, and with no disrespect, meant to Rippon or to Bajan, they're not mentoring anybody. At this point, without adding a veteran quarterback, the mentoring is going to come from the, from the offensive coordinator. I don't see it coming from anywhere else. The mentoring, some of it, will come from Keenan Allen and DJ Moore and some of the other group that they put around him. Like when he steps into an offensive huddle, you know, and your eyes get big and I'm sure Olin can speak to that quite a bit from, you know, quarterbacks walking to like, it's great to have an Olin Krutz in your huddle to calm things down. But from a, you know, from a quarterback room, you know, players room, I, there's not a guy on this roster currently that is going to mentor anybody. Yeah, it's it's always a, a tough question, Cap. Like 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 Geno Smith is interesting for me if we're talking about Shane Waldron, right? It's like, did he get the bump from Shane Waldron or was it Eli Manning and Phillip Rivers? Right? Did he did he go to New York, watch Eli Manning play quarterback, go to San Diego, watch Phillip Rivers, watch the attention to detail, watch the way they prepared for games, watch the way they approached games and got the bump from there. So we'll see. Uh, uh whether you know Shane Waldron again. Uh, was it his mentor or did Geno like I'd like to ask Geno Smith, where do you think you learn the most from? Hopefully Ryan Pose and Coach Eberflus asked him that before they hired Shane Waldron to mentor their quarterback. So uh, that's always an interesting question. Like I got a lot from I, I've told this story many a times. Uh, playing under Casey Wigman when I first got here. I learned a lot about being a pro, uh, how to study. I remember my first meeting, Tom. Uh, I stood up to walk out. You know, I was in my swim shorts and T-shirt because I was an idiot from Hawaii. But I stood up to walk out, and Casey Wigman sitting down writing notes in his book while everyone's leaving. And I thought, I better sit my ass back in my chair and, and study my, my playbook again. I just got to watch how a, a veteran did his job and prepared for the NFL and approached the game. So uh, I think the bump, a lot of times, uh, it comes from, comes from an excellent player or watching a guy who plays at a high level at another position, watching them prepare, watching them get ready for games, watching them study film, take care of their body, get ready to take guys on. I think that's extremely important, uh, what you mentioned there, but it can come from any position on the field and any coach in the coaching staff. So explain to me then when this kid, let's assume it's Caleb Williams. It could be Drake May or Jaden Daniels or J.J. McCarthy. Let's just don't even say that, Cap. You don't believe that. You you you, you don't believe that. You no, you, I do not. I believe it's Caleb Williams. Yeah. I do. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. Lewis Riddick today was on with Rich Eisen, and he said, "Me, I'm taking Jaden Daniels number one." He mm -hmm. said, and I he he claims that he talked to multiple GMs who said JJ McCarthy is the third quarterback in this draft, and he is rocketing up people's boards mm -hmm. as they get to know him. My question is, if it's Caleb Williams, he is going to have the weight of the freaking world on his shoulders when he gets to Chicago, a city, by the way, that doesn't know what a franchise quarterback looks like. My late father's dearest friend was the last franchise quarterback they had 80 years ago. That's Sid Luckman. 80 years. That's how long it's been. So how do you mentor him knowing that dude better start opening day, or what are you doing? That's well, for it's, 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 it's for me. <laughs> well, it felt like 80 years, and I was snapping to all those quarterbacks <laughs> for 13 years. Cap. <laughs> felt like 90 years. <laughs> felt like 100 years. Uh, um, it's a tough. It's a tough position. Uh, Caleb Williams. It seems like uh, this has been his journey his whole life. It's been his journey to be a franchise quarterback, as Tom's talked about. Um, he made all that money in co college last year. Uh, he's he's been he's been projected to be this guy for a while now. If he is the guy, I know what Lewis Lewis Riddick them are all saying. Uh, I I hear them talking. I know it's this time of the year. Uh, you know when you, you have to get on Twitter and say these things and talk about the draft. And uh, Lewis is he's smart. He does know what he's talking about. He's watched way more film than me. Uh, if they think Daniels is the guy, there is going to be a guy who comes here. It doesn't matter who it is. 
comes in here. This is a tough city. It's a tough job. We've talked about all the rewards and benefits you do get if you do become that guy, the guy you like you're talking about, Cap, that we've been waiting for for 500 years, right? This guy here who can be a, a quarterback, a, a fourth throw for 4,000 yards, put the ball in the end zone, uh, find find points on that football field that we haven't seen a lot here. Uh, it's 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 funny, man. It's it's like again, I study the roster. I mean, Keenan Allen's there, yes, and DJ Moore. And the roster is very good, but. That defense is what you're like, again, for the Chicago Bears. <laughs> Here we are again. I swear it's just a Lovey Smith's unit, right? It's just Lovey Smith is back in the chair. It's Coach Eberflus. Uh, him and Lovey, same defense, and they're stacked uh, stacked on defense, and, and they got some questions on offense again. And, and what will we do? And will the quarterback be the guy? It just seems like it's perpetual around here, Cap, that we're going through this every year. I, You know, it, it, it is it's, – it's a steep ask. It really is. Um, I would say to people who are, you know, resigned to the fact that, well, it's never happened, so it's not going to happen going forward. I would just say to those people, I'm not going to judge the current administration based on the failures of the previous administrations. I don't think that's fair, whether it's, you know, Ryan Pace or it's Phil Emery, or whoever it is, or whatever the coaching staff is. I think this is a new era. This is a new situation. And, um, you know, the coaching staff and the administration will be judged accordingly. Uh, I think I will say this, that the person that does become the so-called franchise quarterback here in this town, there is only one guy, in my humble opinion, that will sit higher up on that mountain than him, and that would be Michael Jordan. The first Bears quarterback that becomes a franchise caliber quarterback and is somebody that sits in that seat for 10 years and plays at an exceptionally high level that person will be loved for years to come and will reach heights in terms of popularity that only one person has ever reached, in my opinion, and that's MJ. Man, if you win three Super Bowls in this town, you you may even pass oh, MJ. Yes. Right? Exactly. If you do a Patrick Mahomes that's done over there in Kansas City, yeah. uh, th this is an amazing place to play. Uh, me and you can speak to that, Tom. Uh, that's why you know I, I grew up in Honolulu, Honolulu, Hawaii, and here I am living here because it's an amazing place to be. It's a great city. Yeah, it's, it's it's freezing every day, but it is a great it's a great town. It's a great city, and 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 the fans are amazing. And the Chicago Bears history and their franchise, and even when the uh, owner throws you under the bus, you still love them, right? You still love them. Uh, you still fight. <laughs> it's just it's too easy. I had to take my shot there. Uh, yeah. But but uh, if anybody, what the quarterback is, and, and as Tom said, we all believe it's gonna be Caleb Williams. If he does become that guy, man, what a throne to sit on. What a throne to sit on. Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay, so Greg has a question that I was going to ask, and we'll wrap this up in a few Greg minutes. Gabriel? No, I would not allow him on this show. <laughs> Why not? Greg's a great guy. Don't say that, Cap. Yeah, Come on. One, wonderful. Um, <laughs> now I know why we haven't had a franchise quarterback. <laughs> no, um, hold on. Hold on. No, that's not fair. That's not fair. Anyway. Um, I just put mute on my computer. <laughs> if, I'm, gonna need that. I'm, if, I'm too old to want to jump into that. Caps of cap, cap here to fight everybody this offseason, man. <laughs> okay, so I think they want to take a receiver at nine if the kid from Washington, Roma Dunze, or Malik Neighbors is on the board from LSU. Obviously, Marvin Harrison Jr. is going to go before pick nine. So if no receiver is there. Do you trade down because you've only got four picks? Do you go, oh, wait a minute. There's a left tackle right there. Let mm -hmm. me go get him. Mm -hmm. And then I can mm -hmm. figure out what I do with Braxton Jones. Mm -hmm. Because I don't know if Tevin Jenkins is going to play 12 games, let alone mm -hmm. 17. Mm -hmm. Same for Nate Davis. Or do I draft an edge like Dallas Turner? No, no, or, or no, or take yourself that offensive tackle. Man. I mean, I mean, you know what I'm going to say. I might yeah. take an offensive tackle. Uh, I might take the, the one of the two. If, if Alt or Olu is there from Penn State, I'm taking one of those two guys. No questions asked. Even if the receivers are on the board, I'm taking them. Even if right. the rec yes. two receivers are on the board. I just gave Keenan Allen $21 million. Right? I just, I just did. I, I mean, I, I got to eventually keep investing in my offensive line. Right? I mean, listen, everyone knows I know Braxton Jones. I'm a big believer in him. Right? I worked with him last offseason. I'm a strong believer in this. If you're good enough, you play in the NFL, right? You don't hide from competition. 
draft anybody you want. Put them on the field. I'll battle him. If he's good enough to play, I'll play somewhere else. There's only 32 guys who can play in the NFL. I'm not scared of competition. Bring them in. Bring them in. I'll develop my game. And if 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 he starts in front of me, like you're saying, Cap, maybe I play some left guard. I'm a swing tackle. I, I, you'll play. Like Tom knows this better than anybody. Uh, stop being scared of guys them drafting guys. If you're good enough, you'll play in the NFL. Period. That's that's the way it goes. There's just not enough good football players out there. So don't even worry about who they draft or who they take or whatever happens. If I'm the Bears, if you're actually doing what's best for the Chicago Bears, I'm taking the best football player there at nine, and I'm taking an offensive lineman. Yeah, um, look, I, I mean, I would. I'm I'm a I'm partial to wide receivers. So if one of the wide receivers was, I wouldn't move out of there. Consequently, I wouldn't move up either. I, I would stick it. I think there's enough good football players that you can find someone that can be a difference maker in his rookie season, whether it's a wide receiver or it's an offensive tackle or it's a rush end. Um, like you worked hard to get this number nine pick, right? <laughs> I'd say that half joking, but you know, you might as well, you might as well use it. I, I just don't see, because there's going to be a, my anticipation. I'm no draft expert. I think there's going to be a rush to get quarterbacks. And what does that do? I mean, you got the one you want at one. And then I think what it's going to do is push some really good football players down to nine and I think you're going to be able to find someone that can start day one, regardless of what that position is. And you're you're still not a finished product. So whether it's it's offensive tackle or it's rush end or it's wide receiver, I'd be very reluctant to move out of nine because I think you can get a, a really a really good football player there. Oh, and I, I hear this. Uh, I hear this. Neighbors is flying up boards. I heard that kid can fly. I haven't yeah. seen him. Yeah, there the thing I read today was that multiple teams have him ahead of Marvin Harrison Jr. I'd be mm. careful with that. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I'll listen to the receiver. Black wants to know, could Braxton kick inside and play guard if they did indeed get Alt or Fashanu or one of the tackle prospects? He could. He could. Think, it wouldn't be his, his position that you would want him to play a, a long term for you just because of how long he is and how tall he is in there. But uh, he could kick inside and play guard for you if you needed him to. And that's what I'm saying. He could be a six lineman uh, uh, on, and he could play either guard position, either tackle position, show the value he has. Now, listen, no matter who you draft, they got to come in there and be better than Braxton Jones, right? So Olu or all – I mean, you drop them that high, they're probably starters. But um, you're not worried about that if you're Braxton Jones. You're just worried about developing your game. And like I said, if you're good enough, you will start in this league. It's just – it's just too hard. They just there's just not 32 guys who actually can play left tackle in the NFL. And you see when the Chicago Bears talk about him, when you turn his film on, you see that the kid can play. Braxton Jones can play football. That's why they keep putting him out there. He does a good job when he's out there. I, I he's not by anywhere near elite yet. But you show me how many elite uh, left tackles there are in the NFL. There's like three or four of them. Right. All right. Final thought before I let you guys go. As you look at Caleb Williams, I don't know how much film you've had a chance to watch on him or watch him do his interviews. Do you guys have any concerns about Caleb Williams or from what you've seen, you think he is clearly the number one guy on the board at quarterback? Mm. You know, look, I again, I would preface it all by saying I'm no I'm I'm no draft expert. Uh I watched a lot of his film this year. Um I think because he didn't have a great group around him, he found himself in a number of situations where he tried to do too much. I'm not worried about that. I think if you go back and watch his 2022 film, you'll see him playing on time. Ball comes out quick. He's playing inside the confines of the offense. It's really hard because the offense that they asked him to run with Lincoln Riley and Cliff Kingsbury and those guys, it's just it's a fire drill every single freaking play. And there isn't a lot of structure to it. And, and I think it can promote some bad habits. But I get the sense that he's going to be a really coachable kid. Um, he's the most talented guy I've looked at. And I again, I haven't watched film of all of these guys extensively. Um, but I, I, I have a pretty strong feeling that that's the kid they're going to go and draft. And I, I think he shows some traits that just, I mean, you go down that rabbit hole of, of highlight reel and it's, it's something else. It really is. And for people that say, well, he does it when he wants to get the ball out quick, it comes out quick. When he wants mm -hmm. to throw the ball into tight spots, the ball's thrown into tight spots. He can do it all. 
I'm not saying he's perfect, but he can do everything a quarterback needs to do at the NFL level. We'll see if he can do it consistently enough to take you where you want to go. Oh, yeah, Tom Tom makes a great point, Cap, that when you turn his film on, he's an elite quarterback with an elite arm. Uh, he has he has really like surprising for me was how accurate he is when I when I watched him throw. Now I will say this. Uh, I have not watched Drake May or or, or Jaden Daniels or JJ McCarthy. I watched Bo Nix uh, at when he played Washington against Penix. I've watched those guys in one game, right? I'm not a draft guy. I don't study quarterbacks. I think you got to pay us a lot more money if we start breaking down film on quarterbacks and comparing all that stuff to see what's going on there. I think I told you guys this story, but I did the draft one year when he was here in Chicago and I went down to uh, do the draft there. And, and it was like my fisheries one-on-one class at Washington. There's a lot more than I bargained for, right? I didn't know a mullet could have so many names. All right. I didn't know there's so many scientific names, but anyway, there's so many things to study on these kids. Just Caleb Williams. So uh, it, the only thing question is like Tom is talking about uh, Lincoln Riley runs a one word offense and they're just moving, man. Um, we talk a lot about processing information. I will tell the whoever watches this show, follow Kurt Warner. He does a nice job yeah. talking about processing information and, and spacing and defense. He does a really nice job trying to exp- explain that aspect of quarterback play, how to teach it, what it actually means. I think he does a really nice job uh, verbalizing it and defining it. And, and that's one thing you can't see on film. I can't see that. I can't see the speed of the game. I can't see him redirect protections. As you guys know, I'm a center. It's the first thing I'm looking for. Is he making points? Is he reading the defense? Is he processing information before the snap, after the snap? As Tom's saying, man, when he wants to get the ball out. The, the, the arm is elite, and he's playing at a level. When you, when, when you are talked about as a number one pick, Cap, you're playing at a speed no one else is playing at on that field. Here's the problem when you get to the NFL. Everyone else is playing at that speed. Right. So that is the, that's why there's so many misses at quarterback. If you're watching this show, it's because you can't see them against the speed they're about to see. You cannot see them. They're elite there. They're elite. The ball comes out too fast for the cornerback to make a play on it. Not in the NFL. Not in the NFL. And then you got the elite de- defense coordinators, and the whole thing just changes. And that's why there's so many misses at quarterback. But when you turn his film on, Cap, you see everything you want to see from a quarterback. Now it's Ryan Pose's job to get in a room and see if he can process information at the line of scrimmage. Can he slide the line? It's Shane Weldon's job to figure that out, to figure out if he is the guy for the Chicago Bears, as we're talking about, to sit on the throne. Gentlemen, appreciate the knowledge as always. I just got a text. Uh, there's Ryan Poles and Matt Eberflus at the airport getting on their flight at United Airlines to L.A. To whoa, whoa, time out, time out, time out. No, 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 don't do it. Don't do it. No, don't. Why do you call it commercial? Why do you call it commercial? Tom, come on, Tom. Huh? <laughs> come on. What do you want me to do? I want you to call and order them a plane, fly out of Powaukee. Why are you they're flying going, commercial? They're going commercial, baby. Eber flutes <laughs> and poles going through the United Tom, States. Tom, hey, I, thought, I thought you weren't choosing violence tonight, and you just did. And you just. <laughs> That's it. Uh, oh, man. Yeah, are they sitting in coach? Do you know? Uh, Ryan Pohl is going back to his practice plus. squad roots. Going back to his practice squad roots. Economy plus. <laughs> That's it. Spirit Airlines, the Bears. Caleb Williams is flying everywhere private. He, he don't ever fly United. Yes. Never. Quick story, and I'll let you go. Tommy and I are in a meeting at the radio station with the sales department. Mm -hmm. And they say, hey, we'd like to know, Tom, what's your cell phone carrier? What's your favorite beverage? Where do you like to eat? Where do you like to So they can go out and call on advertisers and go, hey, would you like to have Tom Waddle endorse you? He drinks Tito's vodka or he drives this car. Keyshawn Johnson is sitting in there. And this sweet lady in sales, Oveda Brown, she says, Keyshawn, what airline do you fly? Because I will call on the airline. He goes, I fly PJ, honey. <laughs> and she said, I've never heard of PJ Airlines. He goes, it's called Private Jet. <laughs> We're all like, wow. I've been on with Keyshawn. He's pretty good. 
Yeah, he's good. He's pretty good, man. And, and uh, uh, I heard, I saw a little bit of what Robert Griffin said today. That was awesome. That was. <laughs> oh God, Robert Griffin, he's unbelievable, man. Does everybody understand on Twitter that when when you retweet it and comment, it's exactly what he wants? Like, oh yeah. yeah, everyone fell for what he, he, he everything he wanted to do today. He got done. He posted yeah. it early, and I went right at him. That's a pathetic take. And then he I did got exactly done. what he wanted. Yeah, like, you, you took the bait. I took. You didn't bait. even have to bait the hook. You just bit. You bit steal. As you we've idiot. been saying, as we've been saying, Cap, you are you're fighting everybody this offseason. It doesn't matter who it is, man. He's looking for a fight. Yep, Greg Gabriel. Let's go. Uh, <laughs> all right, you guys have a wonderful night. I appreciate you, you greatly, and I'm sure we'll talk around draft time when the Bears make it official that they have a new quarterback. Have a great night, guys. I appreciate you. Thank you, guys. All right. For Olin, for Tommy, I'm Cap. Thanks for watching a special edition of Feldco Football Recap Live. Tell your friends. Available on demand. Take that.